everybody. Sorry about that. Hey, uh, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to, uh, if you're new to us, just want to say welcome. We're really glad that you're with us this morning. And uh, I want to just mention that if you happen to be um, new, that uh, we have a connect card that's on the high top tables out in the, um, the area we call the commons, just outside the doors. And if you grab one of these and fill it out, we would love to send you our e-news each week. Um, it's a newsletter that we send out um, that you can opt out of later if you'd like. And I'd love the opportunity just to send you a quick text and say, hey, we're glad you visited with us. And, you know, our goal here is for you to, to help you connect in the life of our church and the family as quickly as you can. And uh, to help answer any questions that you might have as the Lord leads you and guides you in your decision about where the Lord might lead, whether the Lord might lead you to connect at Anchor Church. And so if you're new, thank you for being here. We're um, thrilled that you're here. Um, this morning, we're going to be continuing in uh, Matthew chapter 13, and uh, we'll be working through a couple of parables that are there back to back, I think verse 31 through 33, um, parable of the mustard seed and parable of the leaven or yeast, and so we're going to be talking through those this morning. So um, begin to prepare your hearts as we recognize that God takes really little things and he does extravagant and glorious things through the, the faithful obedience of his people. So um, this morning, we're also going to take a few minutes and recognize and honor uh, graduates. Anybody, anybody excited for that? It's always fun. So here's the thing. I want to speak to graduates for a second. I'm not going to ask you to say anything. So if you're kind of worried about that, I am going to call you up, though, and we're going to take a peek at you. 
you know. And, um, and I, I want to take the opportunity to give you a gift and to pray over you this morning and just thank God for you as we, as we seek to send you out and uh, send you as the hands and feet of Jesus into the world around us. So not that this is a game, but here's what I want to do. And I'm not going to do this with the college graduates or the graduate graduates because you've earned the right not to be, you know, poked at at all. You know what I mean? But for the high school students, you got to do something sort of fun. So let's just do this. As I call them up, let's just, I got two pictures. The first one will be like, you won't know who they are. And then the second one will give you an opportunity to go, oh, I know who that is. And then you can give them a hand and they'll come up and join me on the platform. How does that sound? You guys down with that? All right. So all the graduates are like, oh, no. And everybody else is like, yes. So you're doing it for mama and everybody else. So, um, you know, lean into the process. Hey, uh, Jim, give us the first one. This is our high school graduates. Look at that guy. Who is that? Hey, would you guys uh, welcome Jacob Chapelier up to the platform this morning? Jacob. What's up, man? Hey, just come up here. And you, I guess, actually, find your spot right there. All right. Um, here's the next one. Here's the next one. You ready? Who is this guy? Some of you might know this guy. This is... This is Mark Troy. Mark, come on up. What's up? What's up, Mark? How are you? All right, here, here's the next one. People down here know everybody. Okay, so here we go. This is, this is Luke Newman. Hey, Luke, come on up. Is Luke hiding? Where's Luke? Oh, there he is. Hiding over there. I looked over there where, where the rest of your people are, you know? <laughs> I had to go around. So um, here's the next one. Y'all know this guy? I do. I know who it is. This is Eric Richardson. Oh. Eric in the house. Here's Eric over here. Come on, brother. Y'all love these little pictures, right? They're the best. Um, check this next one out. This is so fantastic. I love this. I'm sorry, but I'm, I love this picture. Anybody know? That's right. This is Rain Fry. What's up, man? Come on. Come on up here. Join us. And last but not least, and, you know, you always save not the best for last, but yeah. this will be a good, good, good opportunity here. Y'all know this young lady? It's, it's Hannah baby. Come on. We, I couldn't decide if you let the girls go first or let them go last. And my thought was best for last. You know, you could have let the girls go first because that's what you're supposed to do, but we saved the best for last. So, hey, we got a couple of others that are present with us that graduated either from college or um, from graduate school. Um, so, Emma Harper, we're not going to, like, give you a baby picture, but would you come up and join us on the platform? So... Um, Emma, actually, I don't know if you can see, but she graduated from Georgia Institute of Technology. Anybody out there have an appreciation for that? Okay, okay. And her degree, like, I don't even know how to say all this. It says a Bachelor of Science in History and Technology and Society. So that's, you can tell us, you can tell us all what that means later. All right, perfect. And then um, also Sarah Lewis is here. She graduated from seminary um, this semester with a degree in biblical counseling. So we're super pumped about that. There's a variety of others who have graduated. Um, Abigail Sissel graduated. She's not here with us this morning, but she graduated from Toccoa Falls um, with a degree in family and children's ministry. And uh, back in December, there's the Yunts back there. Andrew Yunt graduated back in December. He's off doing great and wonderful things. Um, his degree was in international affairs. Not sure what he's going to do with that, but it's going to be pretty awesome. And then uh, Miranda Pepe graduated too in December from University of West Georgia with a degree in mass communications. And so, um, and then I, I, I know that Joel um, Robinson graduated from high school this year too. And so um, he wasn't able to be with us today, but we're super proud of him. So um, a couple things. First, we have some gifts. Paul, would you help us? Paul was the youth pastor here for a long time. And I said, man, there's not a better person to help with all of this than Paul. I actually have them in order, and it's okay. I'll come back to you. It's totally fine. You don't have to move. It's fine. It's totally fine. It's all right. Here you go. Here you go. All right. Who's this? Hannah. See? Not in order. How about that? All right. 
Look, look, I didn't tell you. You're right. I'm happy to take the fault, the fall on all of this. Now, real quick, real quick, hang on. Let me see. Paul, you, you still, you're still helping me, right? I am. I'm get, we're giving away weapons this morning, so I'll take that. I'll take that. All right. So this morning, I want to share something with you real quick, and then I want to share something with you. Okay? I won't, I won't hurt you. They're actually sharp. You want to touch them? They're sharp. Yeah, they're, they're sharp. They're pretty sharp. So Scripture says in Psalm 127, it says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the, uh, the, fruit of, uh, the womb, a reward. And then um, verse 4 says, Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children of one's youth. And the truth of the matter is, this is for parents this morning, whether you have somebody graduating or you, you've got a newborn baby at your house, like God has given us a responsibility to prepare kids to be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus in the world. Like he's given us that responsibility. As parents and as a church, like there is a both, like in Old Testament and Deuteronomy, it talks about um, children are a gift from the Lord and the value of children, but he's talking not just to parents, he's talking to the people of God in general, the nation of Israel. And so among the people of God, parents have a responsibility to raise up children, to make gospel impact, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to go into the world and make disciples. And so um, as we continue to grow and learn as a church, we want to do a better and better and better job of raising up children who know Christ, who love Christ, and who are prepared to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. And that's a, that's a commitment that we collectively make together and in the context of our own homes. But here's the thing. Um, at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, go. And this is one of those seasons for you where you're going to go. And some of you will still be in, in the church here at Anchor Church for a season, but every one of you, in all likelihood, will be sent out from this place and your commission, no matter what it is that God calls you to do with the particulars of your life, your commission is to go and make disciples of all nations. That's your commission. There is no other will for your life other than that, if you're a Christian. Everything else is or organized and orchestrated by the Lord to give you a platform and give you an opportunity to be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus in the world. And so in a way, this morning... And I know that some will be here for a long time, some you headed to college in the fall, but in a way, we're shooting you out from this, from this place. We're sending you, we're launching you, um, trusting, not in ourselves, but in the work of the Holy Spirit, that God's going to do in you the things that he intends to do in you and do through you the things that um, make the heart of God glad and the heart of your families and the heart of your church glad. And so uh, we're proud of you and we love you, and I want to give, give you a weapon and you can put it on your wall, and it can be just a reminder or hang it, hang it somewhere, but it can be a reminder to you that God has called you, equipped you, and God is sending you uh, today. Um, mm -hmm. All the guys are like, I have a weapon. Yep. I'm more thinking my child probably will. Well, my, my, more than one person has said, hey, we're going to have to put that in a place on Sunday where Sarah, one of Sarah's kids don't pick it up and stick it, you know, in, in each other. So, you no, know, and I, I can't leave these on the front steps because we all know that Jack likes to run around, and so he's going to be poking kids in the eye too. Hey, can we uh, take a second and pray over these, these young men and young women if the Lord would use them, would indeed use them in this world? Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to recognize these graduates today. Thank you. For the ones who weren't able to gather with, with us this morning, thank you for all the accomplishments that have been made. But Lord, we also thank you for the seed of the gospel that's been planted in their hearts. And uh, Lord, no matter where each one of them is, is on the um, journey of this life in relationship with you, if the seed of the gospel is firmly planted, you will do the work to bring the, the life of the gospel, the work of the kingdom, to bear on the world around them. Uh, Father, we pray for your, your strength and your power as they um, go to make disciples. Father, I pray for mamas and daddies and um, for church family and for extended family this morning that, God, we would send them in faith and rejoice in their sending, but, the Lord, that um, we would undergird their lives and their, their work um, with, the, with prayer and uh, that we would always be a church who is here and is ready to support and ready to encourage them 
in the, in the life that you've called them to live. Jesus, we love you. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Y'all give these guys a hand one more time. All right, you guys can find a seat. You want to stand with us as we continue in worship this morning? I'm not sure how to transition that. <laughs> That's good. Well, you just had a fistful of arrows, so I'm not sure how we follow that up. <laughs> no, seriously, congratulations to each of you, and also congratulations to the parents and families and spouses in JT's case. of uh, you, you did a lot to support each of these graduates to see them through the end, so congratulations to you as well. And uh, what a great gift uh, degrees are in education are. Uh, but what a great reminder, we don't build our life on an education, we build our life on the rock, Jesus Christ. And so let's sing and honor him uh, this morning.
Thank you this morning. Thank you for the graduates. Thank you for their families. Lord, thank you for the reminders of your truth that we can build our life on Jesus Christ, the solid rock, the firm foundation. Jesus, thank you that when, uh, because you're the solid rock, when life is hard and difficult, when the storm comes, um, as you said, when we build our life on you, it's like building a house on rock that can withstand the storm. And so, Lord, we pray today that you would build us in Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for your word. Give us grace to uh, open our hearts and our minds, Lord, and to listen intently to your voice and your spirit today, God. We pray that you'd move among us through the through your word and through um, the good things that you have prepared for us. And we pray these things together as a family, as brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ, our elder brother and the one who leads us. And Lord, we pray these for his honor and glory in his name. You can be seated. As Matt said, we're still in Matthew 13, and I believe Jacob, are you reading for us today, Jacob? Come on up, Jacob. We're going to give attention to God's Word. If you have your Bible and want to turn there, we'll be in Matthew, are we still in 13? Did I speak wrong? Okay. Okay. Details. Jacob, thank you. This is Matthew 13, verses 31 through 33. He put put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when, when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. This is the word of the Lord. (laughs) 
Jacob made it up here twice today. Good job, man. You might get used to that. You never know. I mean, you're in that season where you're trying to figure it out. We'll see. So good morning. So I want to invite you to open in your Bible to Matthew chapter 13, 31 through 33. So from this text, we're exploring two pretty short parables. One that's just a couple of verses, and the other that is uh, one verse. It's the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven, or as some translations put it, the parable of the yeast. So um, these two parables make really similar um, points, but in a slightly different sort of ways. So generally, we're going to see from both parables that the power of God at work um, in and through humanity accomplishes extraordinary kingdom things. We're going to see that in both texts. So I want to invite you to write this down. Uh, it's our big, big idea for this morning. We'll just start out that way. God works in and through his people to accomplish extraordinary kingdom purposes. God works in and through his people to accomplish extraordinary kingdom purposes. So this morning, let's work through these two parables one at a time, beginning with the parable of the mustard seed. So um, here's the thing. A few months ago, um, I got in a quick conversation with my friend. Um, she doesn't even know this is coming, but um, with my friend Kay Mayfield. It's Kay. There she is. See, there you are. Go wave. Yep. And we were talking about mustard seeds. Do you remember that? And um, I don't even remember the whole context of the conversation, but it was about mustard seeds and moving mountains and this sort of stuff. It was a quick discussion. And uh, that came from like Matthew 17, 20, 20, you know, faith like a mustard seed can move mountains. Well, um, lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, um, I come into the sanctuary and I'm going to my seat and my stuff's sitting there and a small container of mustard seeds has appeared on my chair. All right, so uh, just my self-assessment, I, I don't have the greatest memory, you know, like I don't know if it's like ADHD or what it is, but I don't have the greatest memory, and my first thought was like, what in the world is this? I mean, I knew it was mustard seeds, but I, I couldn't remember where, it, I didn't know where it came from, didn't know what was going on, and my, my first thought was like, great, um, what did I do to deserve this, you know, like... Is my faith so small that, you know, maybe it's not doing what it needs to do? Or, you know, uh, what are they trying to say? Are they trying to say that my faith is small and that God will honor it? Or, Pastor Matt, I think you think so much of yourself that, um, you know, you're actually a mustard seed brother. Embrace your insignificance. Or maybe somebody wants to learn more about mustard seeds one Sunday. Like, I was, I was totally confused. But thankfully, Stephanie Newman was sitting like right behind me that week, and she could see the confusion on my face. And I was like, what, what is this about? And she goes, it was, it was Kay Mayfield. So busted. You know, you're caught. So Kay had snuck in. She dropped some mustard seeds in my seat. And tr truthfully, we didn't have another conversation about it for probably like five weeks or four weeks. And I came up to her one Sunday, and I said, I know it was you. I know it was you. You're the culprit that dropped those mustard seeds. So uh, I don't know, Kay, if what you were thinking or how, you know, what your motivation was there, but it's received, and today we're talking mustard seeds. And so um, not because necessarily that conversation, but because it's in the text. It's right here. So um, I have a confession, though. I can't find my mustard seeds. I actually looked all over the place. Like, maybe I left them in my car. They weren't under the seat of the car. You know, it's like the... Things get sucked in under the seat of the car. Or I looked in, the, in like the spice rack at the house, couldn't find the mustard seeds. My intention was to put them in a little baggie and hold them up and be like, look, it's mustard seeds. And then I went to Publix this morning, and they had ground mustard, but no mustard seeds. And so, you know, I almost got the little uh, like dense or like coarse ground mustard so you could actually see it in there. But I'm like, that doesn't even like preach well, you know. So I apologize. There's no mustard seeds here. And I want to encourage you, don't bring mustard seeds next week. I don't need mustard seeds. I just, I'm just saying my intention was to bring them. You know, the text says that they're, real, that they're really small. And actually, Jesus uses hyperbole to talk about their size because the truth of the matter is mustard seeds actually aren't the smallest seeds. As a matter of fact, this morning while I was perusing in Publix, I saw several seeds that are smaller than mustard seeds. You know, so like... Um, uh, poppy seeds, for example, are really small in the, in the grocery store. They're smaller than mustard seeds. 
But what Jesus is doing here in the text is basically using hyperbole to, to, to make a point, saying this little thing grows to this bigger thing, and it's, it's by God's grace and by God's power that it happens. Jesus is illustrating the truth that the kingdom expands from an insignificant beginning to an extravagant end. A really, really small and insignificant beginning to an extravagant end. So I want to encourage you to write this down. It's truth number one. The kingdom expands from insignificant beginning to extravagant end. This is how the, how the kingdom unfolds. This idea of small beginnings leading to unimaginable expansion fits with what we've already seen in the gospel. The story begins with a little baby in a manger in, God, in, in Matthew. It actually begins with a genealogy, but once we see Jesus, it's just a little baby in a manger. And then Mary and Joseph were like exiled to Egypt, hidden away for some years um, before arriving in an itty-bitty town called Nazareth. Now we get to Matthew chapter 13, and Jesus has gathered with a small band of disciples. You know, certainly there's crowds. He's healed some folks. There's people who are um, following him around. But generally speaking, the people he spends the most time with, the people he's investing in, is a, is a small band of 12 men around him, truthfully a group of nobodies. However, in, in the days to come, this unimpressive collection of outcasts, sinners, and stinky fishermen would turn the world upside down. Completely upside down. So much so that today we're sitting here, thousands of miles away, 2,000 years into the future, impacted by these 12 men's witness. And the kingdom of God continues to grow and continues to expand and continues to be made visible in the world through the people of God as in individually we continue to listen to the Lord and take this little bitty bit of who we are filled with the Holy Spirit and God uses us to expand the beauty and the, and the glory of his name in the world to establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And the truth of the matter is, we're going to see this both in this parable and in the, and in the next one. You know, throughout Scripture, I don't know if you remember, we talked about, uh, I think it was from, Matt, from John chapter 16 a while back about um, Christ as the, um, as the true vine, and that we kind of traced the, the, this idea of a tree throughout Scripture. And then Jesus comes in and speaks in parables, and it's all seeds and organic, and Christ is the answer. And so some two years into the future, we're going to look. You know, we sit in the center of God's story. Years into the future, Scripture teaches that in the end, and it's, it's visualized in Revelation as a tree on a mountain, that the kingdom of God will have come and a new heaven and a new earth will be established and that Christ will rule and reign his people, uh, among his people forever and ever and ever. And so um, there's this little bitty investment, and it's not little because it's Christ in the world, born in a manger that is blowing up around the world and expanding around uh, among the nations that will ultimately end in a new heaven and a new earth redeemed by Christ, ruled by Christ, uh, where Christ is worshipped forever. So we're a part of this same kingdom that Christ came and proclaimed, a kingdom that continues to expand today through his church. And the expansion will continue until one day a throng from every nation, tri tribe, and, and people and language will shout the praises of Christ the King. On that day, the kingdom that began as a little mustard seed will be in full bloom forever. It's beautiful. So uh, it's the realization of Revelation 11.15. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his, of his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever and ever and ever. So how does God accomplish this glorious end? That's, that's the question. How does he bring about his sure vision of all nations, tribes, and tongues worshiping him forever in a new heaven and a new earth into being? He plants tiny seed in giant fields. That's what he does. Several thoughts here. Jesus plants the seed of the gospel in fertile human hearts. Jesus plants the gospel in fertile human hearts. Kind of drawing back from the parable of the sower. We learned a few weeks ago that Christ most often through us sows the message of the gospel in the world and some seed falls on fertile human hearts. This seed implants in the heart 
grows roots, shoots up out of the ground, and becomes, by the power of the Spirit, a multiplying force within the kingdom of Jesus. And the truth is, God wants to use, we talked about this, differentiating between those who are truly redeemed and those who are walking in the church, who are not redeemed, are those whose roots are growing deep, who God is growing up, and who are beginning to produce fruit as they live in the rhythm, spirit empowered rhythm of taking in the word and walking in the way of the Lord, listening to the spirit and doing what he says. And that seed grows and that's, that seed um, is cultivated and that seed becomes a root reproducing um, head of wheat. But here's the thing. When the gospel landed in, in my little heart when I was nine, actually before that, but began to put roots down when I was nine years old, I had very little sense about God's future for me. If you've come to faith in Jesus, I'm sure that when you look back on the moment you came to faith, it may have been as an adult. Somebody recently told me, I was 28 years old when I came to faith in Jesus. I came to faith late. And I'm like, late? Like, 28 years old. You still got all of these years in front of you. For some of you in the room, you came to faith when you were like 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. For some, you were older into your adult life, and the Holy Spirit, the truth of God's word by the power of the Holy Spirit was applied to your heart, applied to your life. You repented. You heard the call of Christ Jesus, and you turned from your way, your truth, and your life to the way, truth, and life of Jesus, and God saved you. He saved you. No matter where you were kind of in the trajectory of life or the the unfolding of life, whether you were like nine like me or some other age, you had very little sense. There was a lot of excitement, a lot of um, you know, joy in, the, in, the, in, the, in finding the salvation of God and living in the grace of Jesus, but you had very little sense about God's future for you. And even where you sit today, we have very little sense about what God wants to do in the particulars of our lives, but we know that he's planted a seed that he wants to produce through. We know that. I could not envision the adventures, the struggles, the transforming work of God in my life. And the truth is, that's how God works. And I want to push pause here for just a second. We're in a season in the life of our church where God is at work. Any amens out there? We see God at work, like visible demonstrations of God at work in our church, lives being transformed, people becoming dependent upon Christ and on each other, the Holy Spirit Becoming the one who is our leader rather than more of a self-determined pattern. Like prayer. The reason I know God's at work is the way the people of God are praying at Anchor Church these days. Like you come at 9 and you pray with these people. You come on a Wednesday night, you pray with these people. You get in your small group, your discipleship group, and you begin to pray with these people. The prayers of our church have grown and matured over the last couple of years. Like God is doing great and powerful work. People are saying, well, I got to talk to my neighbor about such and such. I got to invite so-and-so over to my house. I got to do this, and God's using me to do that. Like These are conversations that are evidence that God is at work in us, and he's beginning to be at work through his church. But can I tell you, um, there's another way you know that God is deeply at work in the life of a church, and that's when the enemy rises up and opposes what God is doing. And the, the truth is, if we were willing to just pause for a second, and take inventory of our circumstances today at Anchor Church. There are more like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's happening going on than, than I've seen in any, any church that I've ever, ever led. And that's saying something. We were in New Orleans for 12 years. Like individual families dealing with crises, sickness, struggle, pain. Life seems like it's falling apart. Hear me, God is at work. When the Lord rises up, when the people of God humble their hearts, become dependent upon the Lord, and God begins to pour out his power in and through his church, one of the things that the Lord allows is for the enemy to step in and kick us in the shin. Because even more so, we find ourselves on our faces before the king. And I want to encourage you. When you come face to face with those things, the enemy's agenda is to knock you off. The Lord's agenda is to make you dependent and to build your life in Christ Jesus. So when we face this stuff, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. 
God is near. The Spirit is in us. He is at work, and he's using even the painful and difficult circumstances of your right now to build his kingdom in the future. So hold on. The Christian life was never a safe life. The Christian life is a roller coaster, but Jesus is strapped in this roller coaster with us, and he's in charge. It's how God works in and through his people. So he plants seeds, brings it to life, puts his spirit in us, and places us in the church where we can be watered and taught and protected and encouraged. When the storms come, we're being blown all over the place. Christ is there holding us up. The body of Christ is there as his hands and feet holding us up, encouraging us, dropping some fertilizer in, teaching the word, pouring water on us. As we hear the word and we submit to it, the Lord does an extraordinary work. So I'm envisioning like this little bitty seed of the gospel of Jesus that landed in my heart. And this little bitty per insignificant person in all of human history, Matt Tipton. And God places me in the soil of his church, in the body of his, of his church. And he waters and he encourages and storms come in and the roots are strengthened. And he's doing a work in me, and he's doing a work in you. As we hear the word and we submit to it, the Lord does an extraordinary work. Our lives begin to reproduce, and we become the sort of people with whom others find joy and rest. I love this in the text. Recognize that um, reproduction is not the only end in this journey. His kingdom coming, like the realities and beauty of his kingdom coming, the demonstration of his kingdom through the church and ultimately when all the weeds are pulled out and he, re and he establishes his kingdom and making heaven and earth new. Like there is a joyful and peace-filled and loving like community that is left that is filled with worship of God where no matter what our circumstances are on this side of eternity, Christ rules, Christ reigns, and we live in the peace and joy of the king. Notice in the text, recognize that reproduction is not our only end. We become bushes or trees where the text says, birds of the air come and make their nests. In other words, our lives become such that those around us, no peace, no joy, no rest in relationship with us as we're in relationship with the king. That's really sweet. Some years ago, the Tiptons sat down um, to talk about our vision for our family and we're due to revisit this, by the way. Um, but we sat down to talk about our vision for our family. We talked about being a tree planted in the Word, that we wanted to be the sort of family that drew from the Word of God. And, you know, all the other things in the world that, you know, not necessarily they're bad, but we want to draw from the Word of God and build our lives in the Word of God. We want to live in the Word, uh, pl be planted in the Word and live in the world, though. We determined we wanted to be a family and have a home where other people feel at home and refreshed with us, where they experience the love of God over dinner with us and in proximity to us. We want to be a family whose shade gives comfort and rest to others. We want to draw people close in order to show the gospel and share the gospel of Jesus Christ so they might know him, be redeemed by him. And grow in him. So this, this is something we spent some time talking about. We actually had a painting of a tree that we have rolled up in a closet somewhere right now. But a painting of a tree. And in our church plant in New Orleans, it has hands um, from all the people who were in that, our church at that season. And people that we had the privilege of being a part of their lives and encouraging. And um, it was something we used in the church. But then as we left, we took it. It's, it's ours. And so we've kind of seen it as a demonstration or as a like, picture of our, our family life and who God wants us to be. You know, the truth is we don't always succeed at this. There are even times that we lose sight of the vision that Scripture has given us, that God's Word has given us, that we've established for our family. And, uh, but, but it's something that the Lord's put in our hearts to see people, friends, community members, kids that go to our kids' schools, people we meet out in the community, to see them draw near so that in relationship with us they can see and hear the good news of Jesus. And I think this is something God universally wants to do with his people, with his church. He wants to build a people who are taking in the word of God, who are living by the spirit of God, who are walking in the beauty of Christ Jesus, who are bearing fruit, and 
who are providing shade and providing comfort and providing safety for people around us who, who need the good news of Jesus Christ. So God takes something small in individual people and he builds something great and they become, we become reproducing individuals and families in the world around us. And that reproduction is people coming to faith and then being planted in the ground and then becoming like Christ in that same way. But along the way, our branches become a place where people can take up residence, where they can draw near to the Lord as they draw near to us. And so God takes something small in individual people and grows it up to be something great for the sake of his kingdom. And he wants to do that in you. And he wants to do that in me, in your household, in your family. There's a variety of ways, though, that God takes something small that's kingdom and does something great. So he does that in individual lives. But you, you realize he does that through churches. Jesus plants his kingdom, the church, in particular communities that need Christ. He does that. As a matter of fact, 25 years ago, Pastor Steve Hammock sensed a call on his life to move into the Grayson area to plant Anchor Church. He was driven by a desire and a calling to multiply the gospel and the kingdom in Gwinnett County. Praise God. Amen? Amen. In 2010, Elaine and I sensed a similar call to carry the gospel and to multiply the kingdom in the city of New Orleans. And praise God, today there's a church there that loves people and is known for being a church that loves the community around them. Over the last 13 years, you may not know this, but in our denominational affiliation, over the last 13 years, 10,000 Baptist church planters, along with their teams of people, felt a similar call to plant a new and reproducing church somewhere in the United States of America. 10,000 new churches. That's pretty unbelievable. The gospel at work in the human heart ultimately brings the kingdom to life in the world around them. And at times, the Lord leads and calls some to step into a community, a new community, to plant a reproducing kingdom presence. And the truth is that starts in individual hearts, individual families, and people that God brings together for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of, of kingdom presence in a particular place. Praise God he did that work in and through Pastor Steve. Praise God there's a church in New Orleans where people can be loved and they know the good news of Christ there. You know, we're here today because God moved the hammocks to obedience and sacrifice. Today, an established faith community, as a fa an established faith community, we must honor the call and work God did in Pastor Steve by picking up the baton and carrying it forward by hearing and growing in the word, by reproducing our lives in other people, beginning in discipleship groups and in community with one another, and being a church where people are uh, experiencing the love and the peace and the joy and the rest of God by encouraging the lost in our community with the gospel and as the Lord gives opportunity by multiplying kingdom churches. God takes something small, Pastor Steve's investment in a particular community, and he grows it and God has purposes beyond today for it. You realize like Jesus had 12 men that he walked life with for, for three years. And those 12 men, there were 120 at the resurrection of Jesus that were hanging out, kind of following these 12 people, were following Christ. Look around here. There's about 120, 140-ish people in the building today. And imagine what God might do considering what God has done with a group of people who say, I will take in the word and do what it says and be led and empowered by the Spirit of God. People who believe in the truth of the resurrection so deeply that they live a totally new life in response to it. People who say, not my will, not my voice, not my way, not my truth, but Christ's way, Christ's will, the Spirit's leading, God's will, no matter what it costs, I'm in with Jesus. God wants to take Anchor Church today. You know, we're in a season. It's, we're on the back end of it new, being a new season, but we're in a season where we're saying, God, do in us, do a fresh and renewed thing in us. Build your kingdom through your church. Amen? Amen. I know it's hard to see sometimes past our current moment. I think that the, 
The phrase sometimes people use is they can't see past the end of their nose. Do you know what I'm saying? It's hard to see past our current moment, but I believe God wants to multiply his kingdom and our church in the world around us. You know, so for Anchor Church to grow to a place where teams of people are being sent out from among this people to sow the message of the kingdom in new places and establish new churches, like individual people have to discern and determine, I will be the seed that God has planted. I will be the sort of person that says, God, whatever you want, however you lead, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want, however you want me to step out in, I will hear and I will obey. And in time, as each one of us as individuals do that in collection and community with one another, God will build his church. It's what he does. And God will multiply his church. And God will expand his kingdom. And if the Lord tarries 2,000 years from today, there'll be hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people, maybe millions of people, who are in the eternal kingdom of God because we decided whatever Christ says we will do. You know, Jesus takes small things in individual and families and does great things. Jesus takes churches, even itty-bitty little small churches, and multiplies his kingdom and develops something great. And Jesus plants his followers among the nations. He plants his followers among the nations. Anchor family, you may not think about it like this, but you realize you were among the nations. Now, Certainly, we, when we think about nations' languages in the church, nation language, language in the church, we often think, well, I've got to go to some other nation, right? But the truth is, most of us are not Jewish people living in Israel in the original context of God's word. We're somewhere thousands of miles away, 2,000 years into the future. God's planted seeds in a whole lot of somebodies that led, led to us knowing Christ and being a part of his multiplying kingdom. Isn't that sweet? So reaching the nations, I think, as we grow, it begins by growing and reproducing where we are planted with an eye for communities and people among whom Christ is not named. Now, God may, like he did with the Hamiltons several years ago, call some of you to get up, to attach to some organization. The church sends you, and you go, and you plant your life in some other part, part of the world. Like the Campbells, another partner that we have. My, my brother-in-law and, and sister-in-law are, are, are in another part of the world, being the hands and feet and voice of Jesus, raising up pastors and missionaries. Like There are people, I think, in this room. Parents, your child, God may call your children to step away from this place in this context into some other place in this country or in the world. Some place where, oftentimes we call it the 1040 window, some place where less than like 1% of the population knows who Christ is. God may call your children to lay their lives down for the cause of the gospel of Jesus. It gives a new sense or a new meaning to this idea of us launching our children as disciple makers into the world. We ought to grow strong arms in our preparation of our kids so that we might shoot these children to the nations. But here's the deal. The nations are among us. And learning to love and serve and reach the nations begins today. Think of your neighbors, your coworkers, your classmates, people from all over the world. My neighbors, I have next-door neighbors who are a Muslim family, who are Somalian by nationality, who need Christ? They're my next door neighbors. There's already been moments where we've been able to bring the peace of Christ in small ways in. And we're praying for more opportunities. Uh, Paul, I, I don't remember the answer to this, um, but there's at least 60 nationalities at Cooper Elementary. Is that about right? I actually, I'm going to, let me do this real quick. I actually pulled up my picture from when we had the day there last year, and there's some 60-ish, 62, 63 different flags hanging in the, um, if you didn't see it, it's right here. I'll show it to you later. It's, I, I should have put it up there. Some 60 flags representing a ton of different nations from all over the world. Kids and fa- They represent kids and families. They go to school next door. This community in particular over the last 15 or 20 years, has totally changed. 
What a great, what a great set of news for us. For those of us who are like really like culturally narrow in our, in, in the, in our comfort level. And that's most people, frankly. That's most people. God is calling us to say, because he's placed us in this place, we're here. He's calling us to say, I am here. We are here. And it may not have been the same situation 25 years ago when Pastor C planted this church, but part of what we need to be saying is, God has planted us here because the nations are among us. Stepping outside of our comforts and our, what's normal for us and our, you know, our, our day-to-day situation, our day-to-day cultural realities and saying, the nations are among us. I need to step in to our, my community and get to know and love and serve the hundreds and hundreds of nationalities, frankly, that live in our community. It's amazing. What an amazing gospel opportunity. I hope that's your mindset. It's, it's a biblical mindset that God would place his people among people from all kinds of places for the sake of his kingdom and his vision in the end where all nations, tribes, and tongues are represented around the throne, worshiping the king of kings. The truth is, if we're willing to listen and we're willing to obey where we're planted here and now as little bitty seeds, and if we're open to the work of God in our lives and in this church, God will be faithful to call every one of us into the neighborhood, and he will be faithful to call some of you to move, to relocate your lives and your families and your witness into a place where the name of Jesus is not being proclaimed. And it would be wonderful. Like the Hamiltons, who we interviewed a few months ago, Campbells, my brother-in-law and his family, who are in Asia, God is going to call some from among us, maybe even some of your children, to carry the gospel to places in the world where Jesus is yet worshipped. And he's going to take the seed he planted in a nine-year-old heart or a 28-year-old heart, or a 60-year-old heart, or a 5-year-old heart, and it's going to grow, and God is going to use the the seed of the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God in your heart and your life to be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus, to bring the kingdom of Christ in a visible way to the world around us. All of this witness and going and kingdom multiplying feels honestly big. Maybe where we sit today a little inaccessible, scary. Anybody else feel all that? I do. But here's the thing. The power and potential is inside the seed. I think we have a tendency to hear all of this, and we think, well, I could never do that. I could never be the gospel to my neighbor. I could never help plant a church on a team and go multiply the kingdom of God in another community 15 or 20 miles from here. I could never, like, quit my job and move to Africa or Asia or South America or the Middle East or some other place in the world for the kingdom cause. I could never do that. That's scary. But here's the thing. It's not, it's not up to your power. Like, you take a look at a little bitty mustard seed, and from the outside... There's not a lot to it. You look at it and you think, I don't know. I'm not sure that's going anywhere. But the truth of the matter is the power and potential is inside the seed. We look at a single mustard seed, and it's easy to overlook it as completely insignificant. As a matter of fact, if you threw a mustard seed out in the yard, you would never find it. Because it seems completely insignificant. But it's not, because God has put everything needed to become a tree where birds come and rest inside that seed. And that's true for you, and it's true for me, and it's true for us at Anchor Church. We are nothing. The truth of the matter is, we're dirt made in the image of God. That's who we are. Our lives, our family, our church in the massive field of Gwinnett County, in the massive field of the nations, we're incredibly small and incredibly insignificant. Toss that little seed out into the yard. Where'd it go? But we have the Spirit of God in us who is taking the Word and is growing us up and is leading us and guiding us and empowering us 
to make a multiplying impact in the world. It's not up to you. It's not up to me. It's the gospel at work in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Beyond the work of the Holy Spirit, what does it take for our lives to count in this way? So here's the thing. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. But there's a whole lot of people who are hearing the word every week and saying, Ugh, and there's this wrestling back and forth. You know, am I going to listen? Am I going to take it in? Am I going to allow it to be heart level? Am I going to allow it to be convictional? Am I going to submit to the work of the Holy Spirit who is bringing this word to visible life in my actions and in my day to day? So what does it take for our lives to count in this way? It takes the work of the Holy Spirit. But in Matthew 17, it's funny that the spaces and places that Jesus talks about, mustard seeds in particular, here he's talking about the kingdom being planted, the gospel of Christ being planted, some truths that are being lived, being planted. But in the mix of that, Matthew 17, the disciples are having a hard time casting out a demon. And Jesus tells them it's because of what? Their lack of what? It's because of their lack of faith. It's because of their lack of faith. And then Jesus says in verse 20, For truly I say to you, if you have faith like the, a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to a mountain, move from here to over there. Again, it's hyperbole. Nobody's really moving mountains these days. But Jesus is illustrating something. Move from here to there and it will move. And nothing, nothing, one more time, nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing. Now, we're talking in the context of God's unfolding kingdom. This is the will and way of God in the world. If we step out in faith, trusting as the Holy Spirit speaks and as the Word reveals His truth, the next step, because that's seed. It's not, we're not transplanting a big bush here. Seed, what is the next act of faith, the next step forward, the next thing God might call me to do? And here we are. Will I step or will I not? I always think Indiana Jones. Do you remember that particular scene where the great chasm is there and he's like reading the... The instructions, he's like, oh my gosh, and then he just sort of steps out in faith, and there's you, the camera angle turns, and it's all digital, but the camera angle turns, and there he is, he's standing on the, on the path over the chasm. Every single day we get into the Word, every single sermon that we hear, the Holy Spirit is at work in us, and he's moving in us, and he's calling us to take another step. Scripture says of Scripture, that Scripture is is a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. It's not like this big beam that shows us the entire way. It shows us the next step of faith. So we take in the word, and God gives us the next step of faith. And here's the thing. Ultimately, this seed that God has planted in us, this gospel seed that God has planted in us, the spirit is in us, and that, the spirit of God, the gospel at work in us and the spirit of God are leading us every day to just take the next step. Just take the next step. Now, it can get all kinds of scary out there. When God gives us, we pray, God, give me a vision for my future. Be careful with that one. I can tell you at nine years old, if you told me all the things that Elaine and I and the kids and everybody's walked through, I'd been like, oh, I don't know about all that. But God has been so good. All the Lord's looking for in the middle of your storm in the middle of your tragedy, in the middle of your difficulty, in the middle of your struggle, worry and anxiety is in the future. Remember, we talked about this just recently. Do not be anxious about anything. Like, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Let tomorrow take care of itself. God is calling us to take this little itty-bitty faith step that's the next step, to allow the seed of the gospel and to work and the Holy Spirit to work through us in such a way that we're willing to say whatever it is the Lord says, not 10 steps down the road, not five years down the road, not whatever, fill in the blank, but what is my next step? God, where are you leading me today? The disciples, when they're casting that demon out, they were attempting something for God without faith in God, without a dependence upon the Holy Spirit and a faithful obedience. They were attempting something for God 
without being led by the Spirit and walking by faith. They were saying, I'm going to earn his favor. He's going to be super happy with me. I'm going to take this step. Or I'm going to run this trail. Or I'm going to go do this thing. When all that Jesus asks is for us to listen to the Holy Spirit and take the next step. Take the next step. Sometimes that next step is just a conversation. The Holy Spirit lays a person on your heart and you just call them up. You don't even know what it is. Hey, I just want to call and check on you. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I feel like the Holy Spirit puts you on my heart. Test the Lord in that. Have a dream about somebody? Call them up afterwards. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but just check. Take the next step. You're in the grocery store and you have a conversation with somebody and the Holy Spirit's like, ask them if they go to church. Ask. That's, all, that's the next step. You're not responsible for next week or whether they come to faith in Jesus or not later or whether they ever show up at church. You're only responsible for the question because the Holy Spirit called you to do it. Test him. Try it out. When the Holy Spirit calls you to you know, fill in the blank. There's a thousand different things that we could list here. But jump in a small group. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a big step. But it's just faithful obedience. Taking the next step. But there's all of these hurdles. There's all of these things. There's all of these possibilities. I might not succeed at it. I might not be able to get the devotions done. I might have to share my story. That's too scary. I might have to do this. I might have to do that. So let's not worry about that. Let's just worry about it. Taking the next step. There's people that have signed up for this next round of Rooted, it starts tonight, who have all the excuses in the world not to take the next step. All kinds of excuses. Way better reasons. But they're taking the next step. And, man, I admire that. Because it's not an issue of what if. It's an issue of I've got this thing in front of me. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to make them all just because... I got this going on, I've got that going on, but I'm taking the next step. We don't have to worry about the tree right now. We have to worry about trusting in God who will do and produce great things as we walk day by day by the Spirit, by faith. Listening and obeying the leading of Jesus by faith. Take the next step. And God will move mountains and grow his kingdom. And by his spirit, through our faithful obedience, will do great kingdom things. Ask yourself. Allow these questions like to burn in your heart every day. What is my next step? What is my next word? Who is in front of me that needs to see Christ or hear the gospel? Lord, lead me. And he will. This is the pattern of the Christian life. You'll wake up one day in your life, our church family, your family, and you will be shade and shelter for others. But today, all you have to worry about is taking the next step and to trust that what God has planted in you and what God is putting in you week by week in the Word or day by day as you dig into the Word is good and powerful and the Holy Spirit is going to do great things to produce a great tree that provides shelter and reproduces His kingdom in the world. There are some of you, we've mentioned this several times the last few weeks, you will never see all the fruit of your life. As a matter of fact, most of you will never see even close to the majority, half of the fruit of your life until you stand before the King of Kings. But I can promise you, if you don't live step by step, day by day, there will not be much fruit for Jesus to return and to show you in eternity. Don't worry about stacking fruit. Worry about taking steps. Let's worry. Let's be a church that worries about taking the next step. Write this down. There's only two truths. So that'll give some of you some peace because I got a minute and seven seconds up there on the screen. And I'm going to go blowing past that. So write this down. It's truth number two. The kingdom permeates every facet of our lives and every corner of the earth. The kingdom, kingdom permeates every facet of our lives and every corner of the earth. Matthew 13, 33 Jesus shares the second parable. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman or a man or a person takes and hides in three measures of flour till it was all leaven. So, where the parable of the mustard seed was about kingdom expansion, the parable of leaven is about kingdom permeation. Kingdom permeation. 
So I'm not a big baker. That may surprise some of you. But I have done just enough to understand leaven and yeast just a little. Some of you in here, you know way more about it than I do. But this year was um, one of the first years we've been without king cakes. You know, we came from New Orleans. We love, love a good king cake. You know what I'm saying? And so this year we decided we'd make them on our own. And some of them turned out real good. Some of them turned out okay. But I'll tell you, the ones that turned out really good are the ones that have this stuff in it. You know what this is? It's yeast. This one is Fleischmann's Rapid Rise Instant Yeast. Fast acting. I don't know if it's the good stuff. I have no idea. That's what we used. And it worked. It worked. We took a stab at baking our own king cakes instead of ordering them. And it worked. What's amazing is just how just a, this little bitty packet, just a little bit of yeast under the right conditions brings the baked goods to life. Catch that. My instant yeast packet says on the back, yeast is a living organism. Don't heat your water too much because you can kill your yeast. Okay, so bottom line, what's in this little packet is alive. It's alive. Now, wouldn't it have been great if I had mustard seeds? See, now, now we're regretting not having the mustard seeds. What's in the little packet is alive. In order to activate it, if you read on the back, it says, heat up some water, but only to this temperature. You with me? Those of you who bake, you're like, yeah, I'm with you. Okay. And then put it in there and wait. It's got to start, like, doing its thing. You know, and start moving around and living well. So it's, in order to activate it, you put it in warm water and you wait. And after it's activated... You add your dry ingredients, your flour, your salt, maybe sugar, depending on what it is you're making. And then what's next? Somebody want to give me some pointers? Stir it up. It's supposed to be super thick if it's like bread or whatever. So it actually ends up being kind of like gloopy and you put more flour in. It get, comes away from the edges of the bowl. Okay, I've done this a little bit. You know, it comes away from the edges and then you flour your table and then you dump that joker out. Sometimes. And you need it, and you need it, and you need it, and then you put it in the fridge, or you put it on the countertop. And what happens then? It rises. And then some recipes, you have to punch it down, pull it out, knead it up, and let it go again. And then you shape it into whatever you're going to shape it into, and you put it in the oven, and you eat it. And it's good. And in king cake's sake, you know, you're like braiding these pieces of dough and there's sugar and cinnamon all over the place and you put them in a, in a wreath sort of shape and you let them rise just enough but not too much because then it doesn't look right and it's too like fluffy and you stick that joker in the oven and you cook it and then you cover it with sugar and all kinds of other good things and then you eat it and it's best warm. And my, look, if you were in my um, particular discipleship group, you got to enjoy some of that this year. We brought them uncooked and baked them while we were doing discipleship group stuff and we ate those jokers hot and it was good. I think a similar process is being described in this particular verse where this person took and hid three measures of flour, uh, hid in it, hid uh, leaven in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. So we don't get all the details here. But bottom line, she took it put leaven in the, in the, in the uh, wheat, liquids, whatever it is, and she kneaded it. And the text says that it was um, basically hid in the measures of flour. So I'm guessing like she's kneading it, she's kneading it, she's working it, she's working it, she's hiding it in the flour. She sets it aside and then she bakes whatever it is that she's cooking. So here's the thing. Um, this, is what, this is what Christ is doing with us. He has placed his spirit in us and his word in us. And he is bringing about his life and his likeness in us. And in the end, it's going to be sweet to someone's taste. So first, the gospel of the kingdom permeates our lives and the church. And, and here's how it works. The gospel hits your heart. Christ hits your heart. The Holy Spirit, you repent and the Holy Spirit falls on you. And the leaven of the gospel, the leaven of the Holy Spirit is like placed into your life. And in the context of the church, and in the context of the word, God goes to work, needing your life, 
and he goes to work kneading your life. And the leaven or the yeast makes its way through the whole thing. So listen, you come to faith in Jesus, he owns you, but there is a work by the Spirit and by the Word that God wants to do where the life of Christ and the likeness of Christ takes over every aspect of your life and brings it to life. Through a process of discipleship, through a journey with Christ and his word, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the context of the church, as you suffer and struggle and you're beat down, life begins to come into being in you. And you become the sort of person where every portion of your life Every part of your life is touched and brought to life in Christ Jesus. And the more you look like Christ, the more the world around you sees you and goes, wow, there's something there. There's life there. And when the, I'm taking the metaphor a little far, forgive me for this, but when the heat hits you and life is tough, and you're afraid it's going to burn you all up, that's when the world smells the sweetness of your life because you've got the life of Christ in you. And what begins deep down on the inside over time, you know, you take a look at the list of of, of sins that have a hold of you. God begins to free you and set you loose and make you more like Christ in your character and your actions and in every, every part of your life and every way of your life. And you begin to look like Christ and the heat begins to be applied and the smell begins to come from the kitchen and the world begins to go, I smell that, I see that, that looks good. There's something beautiful going on there because, not because you're great, you're just a lump of flour. But because Christ is in you and has brought the life of Christ about in you. Christ suffered. That One of the most beautiful things about Christ was the way that Christ suffered and struggled in this world when the heat was applied. And there's beauty and goodness and sweetness that comes from the people of God as we walk through these difficult challenges. But here's the good news. Our lives have been permeated with the life of Christ Jesus. He has brought us to life. It's not for nothing. It's so that the world might see, smell, and experience the beauty of Christ Jesus. And here's the cool thing. When God does that in individuals all over the room, his life permeates our lives, brings the things that were dead to life, chases the sins away, sets us free, brings the things that were something and were ruling us to nothing. When he does all of those things, collectively as we live and walk um, life together, Christ begins to permeate the world around us through our witness and the conversion of lost people. And his whole plan is not just to leaven you as a lump. You were dirt and now you're flour. His goal was not just to leaven you as a lump. His goal was to make all things new. And he makes all things new. He brings about a new heaven and a new earth. As your heart and your life and your actions and your mind become more and more like Jesus, as we collectively grow to be more and more like Jesus, as we serve one another and build into one another, and we step out in the world to demonstrate all of that in our corner of the world, the kingdom of God just begins to be made visible. And it unfolds and it multiplies. And life springs from this place into the community and a sweet aroma of Christ's kingdom begins to be evident in a a particular community. And sometimes, those of you who bake, this is like advanced stuff. Sometimes you can take a little bit out and you can go plant that stuff in some other flour and mix it all up and it keeps growing. And you take a little more out and you put it in this lump and you mix it all up and you let it sit in the fridge and it keeps growing. And God has a plan, I think, to do the work in us that brings about the life of Christ so that ultimately we can impact the neighborhood, but not just the neighborhood. So that God might raise up some men and women, boys and girls, to go and be the power of the life of Christ Jesus, not just in the neighborhood, but among the nations. It's something God wants to do. But here's the thing. Don't freak out about all that. Just take the next step.
might be familiar with this. You know, children's books, Just Keep. You know what I'm talking about? Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Um, Dory, like, just keep walking. Just keep walking by faith with your ears and your heart tuned to the, the, the good word of Christ Jesus, to the Spirit of God, taking steps, sometimes leaps of faith, and trust that God has planted something that's going to grow and that God is doing something in you that's going to leak out there into the world. It's going to waft out there into the world. All kinds of like metaphors that we're getting all mixed up. Um, it's going to waft out in the world, and he's going to change the world through your life. You may not ever see all the, all the power and beauty of what he's going to do, but he has a plan for you and for me and for Anchor Church to do great um, kingdom things through us. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for this uh, word. We thank you for um, speaking in these parables and bringing um, the work and life of your kingdom to life for us. Father, we, um, we thank you for planting the seed of the gospel of Jesus in our hearts and our lives. Father, I pray for brothers and sisters of Anchor Church that are around this room. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't get caught up in the what-ifs or the, the fears or the anxieties of, of what's down the road. But Lord, that today in response to your word, that we would just get up, hear a word from the Lord, and say yes. Take the next step. Because you take small faith, small acts of obedience. The work of the gospel is us. Living by the Spirit, taking day-by-day -day steps as not us, but you build your kingdom. Lord, build your kingdom in us and through us. Help us to see purpose in the heat that is applied to our lives. And uh, Lord, help us to remain faithful day by day. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll respond to the Lord as we sing.
to take just a few minutes here at the end of our service and celebrate communion together. Um, Communion, we do this every uh, month at the first of the month. And communion is a um, time in the life of the church that has roots in the Old Testament, in God's salvation of the Old Testament people, but um, that God um, brought forward into the new covenant to represent the shed blood and broken body of Jesus Christ. And so um, the roots in the Old Testament, I think, were a connection back to the sacrificial system and a look forward to the work of Christ in the New Covenant. But today, we sit on this side of the cross, and we look back, and we see the shed blood of Jesus and the broken body of Jesus and ultimately the resurrection of Jesus. And this is the center. This thing that Christ has done in laying his life down and, and being raised from the dead is the center of our faith and life in the church. It is... Um, it shows, you know, Christ's death and suffering shows that us dying to our own sin and being brought to new life as the body of Christ goes into us. The symbolism shows that our lives are the life of Christ. In a way, it demonstrates per- permeation. You know, we're taking in something that symbolizes the life of God, the seed of God landing in our soul, in our hearts, in our lives, and Christ permeating us, becoming more and more like Christ. As a matter of fact, I often read from the text in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul recounts the disciples like giving out communion and, and um, you know, leading through communion. And one of the things I love about this particular text is it calls us to examine ourselves. It calls us to recognize that the work of Christ isn't something we just accepted and it was over. The work of Christ is something that begins in the work of the Holy Spirit when we repent. And, you know, symbolically, the Christ now in us, this bread and this, this wine, this juice that's in us, the fruit of the vine that's in us, symbolically shows that the life of Christ is becoming our life. That we are the resurrection of Christ Jesus in the world, the resurrected Christ for the world to see. So it's, it's a beautiful thing that the church is called to do. And so... I want to invite you to join me in this, in this time. Um, just for a moment, we're, um, I don't want to um, belabor, but I, I do want to give us a little bit of time just to take before the Lord. And um, in just a second, I'll invite you guys to come and get the elements, go back to your seat. But I want to encourage you, uh, go before the Lord, examine your heart and your life. Um, verse 27 of chapter 11 says, it says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. And I, I think when we think about that verse, it's definitely talking about s- sins that are reflected in human relationship, like the brokenness of human relationship. So I think a good first place to examine is, you know, am I walking in unity with the other brothers and sisters who have brought, been brought to new life in Christ Jesus? But then beyond that, I think 
a way to think about this is, you know, Christ has given me new life. Are there ways I'm still living and um, promoting and walking the old dead life Jesus saved me from? Is my, am I pursuing the likeness of Jesus in my life? And if you look at yourself and you say, I'm not sure that I do, I think you go before the Lord and say, Christ, here I am. I rest in your grace and mercy, and I begin anew to, again today. Day by day, I'm beginning anew again today. Walking in your grace, walking in your mercy, walking in your power as someone who's been made new and has been brought to life. So I want to invite you to take a few minutes. And if there's people in the room you think, man, I need to go say something to that person. I've had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. Or there's a disunity there. I want you to feel the freedom to get up and go run across the room and say, I just want you to know there's something we need to talk about later. But I want you to know it's me. And I, I, just, want to, I just want to walk in unity and in grace with you. And then return to your seat. And, um, because I think that there's a heart behind the celebration of communion as it relates to our, our unity in this body. So let's take a few minutes, examine our hearts, and then I'll invite you to come get the elements. So as has been our uh, practice and pattern, I want to invite those of you on my right, your left, um, here in the center to get up from the front and work back. In the front row, come and get the elements and then come and return to your seat. And we'll just kind of work out that direction and come around and come find your seat. And then we'll go to the outside and do the same and come back to your seat. Maybe come inside to out. I don't know if that makes sense, but anyway, you're with me. And then those of you on the left side as well, if you'll, um, if you'll come out and grab the elements and return to your seat, starting in the front and moving to the back and then the outside. And then um, once we've all received the elements, and then uh, I'll lead us as we take it together in unity as a body. So I invite you to, to go ahead and move now.
In 1 Corinthians 11, um, beginning of verse 23, Paul says to the church, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Grace and peace. 
you're dismissed.